This is why addicts are often left chasing a high that they can no longer biologically achieve. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, I'm Ray the Science Girl here to talk to you about all things science. Now, before we get started, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button down below because it does help me out quite a lot. Now, without further ado, let's get right into today's topic. Welcome to the series, Addiction, Addiction Disease or choice, choice, where we find out whether addiction is a disease or a choice. choice. Today we're talking about the second most trafficked illegal drug in the world, a multi-billion dollar industry. 7.5 million Europeans between the ages 15 and 34 and 35.3 million Americans over the age of 12 have admitted to using it at least once in their lives. With a potential for overdose, a high affinity to cause addiction, and the ability to alter brain structure and function with repeated use, the spotlight is on cocaine. We're gonna be talking about where cocaine comes from, how it makes you feel, how it interacts with your brain's reward system, and whether cocaine is a disease or a choice. Cocaine comes from coca leaves, and for thousands of years, people in South America have been chewing and ingesting these coca leaves for their stimulating effects on the brain. Now, that was all fine and dandy, but the problem arised when the plant was processed and the purified chemical cocaine hydrochloride was isolated from the plant. This happened about a hundred years ago, and so began the infamous reign of cocaine on our minds. Now, you must be thinking, Rhea, why wasn't it a problem when people chewed the leaves for thousands of years? Why is it a problem now? If cocaine comes from plants, isn't it basically a vegetable? Doesn't that make it good for us? Why is cocaine bad? Well, I hate to break it to you, but that is actually not true. See, it takes about 370 kilograms of coca leaves to produce one kilogram of cocaine. So even though the leaves and the purified cocaine hydrochloride are both stimulants that work in the same way, the effects are extremely amplified in the powdered form because of how concentrated it is. And let's be honest, no one is sitting around in their living room chewing on 370 kilograms of coca leaves. The purification process is a tiresome one and often very unhygienic due to the areas and conditions that it takes place in. It involves treating the leaves with a myriad of chemicals such as chlorine, bleach, kerosene, sulfuric acid, and the waste is generally dumped into the nearest water body or river. This primary extraction process could take up to four days and is generally carried out by workers who don't get compensated well for their work at all. Think about it, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and these workers get paid about $80 for four days worth of work. So in addition to creating extremely toxic and high risk work environments, this process also contributes to polluting our oceans and exploiting underprivileged workers. There are a few different ways that cocaine can be administered, but the primary goal is to allow the substance to be absorbed into our bloodstream so that it can be transported to the brain. Cocaine can be taken intranasally by snorting, it can be taken orally, intravenously by injection, and it can be inhaled by smoking. The effects of the substance and the intensity of these effects are heavily dependent on the individual, the amount of cocaine consumed, and the method of ingestion. The experience may include a strong euphoric rush, an increase in heart rate and blood pressure, hypersensitivity and mental alertness, which could lead to paranoia and anxiety at times, sweating, nausea, an increase in energy and hyperactivity, a strong desire to be social, inflated self-confidence, strong emotional responses, and possible hallucinations. These effects are almost instantaneous and last only for a couple of hours. Due to its size and other chemical properties, cocaine can actually pass through the blood-brain barrier and therefore hijack our brain's natural reward system and thus begins the rigorous test of our self-control against cocaine. Now, don't get me wrong, because there are people out there who can occasionally ingest cocaine and not feel the compulsive need to constantly chase that high. However, there are also people out there who are naturally more prone 
to addiction and abuse. If you're interested in finding out more about what differentiates these two groups of people, I did address it in my last video, so feel free to check that out. I will link it down in the description box as well as the info card above. Cocaine use most prominently alters the natural pathway of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Now, I'm sure many of us have heard of dopamine in at least some aspects of our lives. It's often linked to feelings of motivation and pleasure. However, many do believe that its main purpose is evolutionary. Dopamine generally becomes active when we do something that is crucial to our survival, like eat. It basically creates this memory loop in our brain so that we don't forget to do these activities that keep us alive. Kind of like a reminder on your phone. Now, let's take a look at the general dopamine pathway. Please excuse my drawing, guys. I am definitely not an artist. So this is how our neurons communicate. This is the presynaptic neuron. This is the postsynaptic neuron. And this gap is called the synapse. When we eat, for example, dopamine is released into the synapse and it binds to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. This binding action triggers the release of specific proteins that tells our body that dopamine is being released and we need to take note of the activity so we can remember it and do it again. Once this protein is released, dopamine's job is done and it gets reabsorbed into the presynaptic neuron through dopamine transporters to be reused next time. What cocaine does is it blocks the dopamine transporters that are responsible for the reuptake of dopamine once its job is done. So there's an oversaturation of dopamine in the synapse and an overstimulation of the dopamine receptors in the postsynaptic neuron, which produces the famous cocaine high or the feeling of euphoria that you get during a cocaine high. One thing to note about our body is that it loves to maintain homeostasis. So upon repeated use of cocaine, in order to combat this overstimulation, our body begins to decrease the number of receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So now there's an overstimulation of dopamine still, but not enough receptors. So the dopamine basically has to take turns to bind to the receptors and the intensity of the high goes down. So let's recap. Cocaine triggers the release of excessive amounts of dopamine in the synapse, which tells our brains to form a strong memory loop of the activity so we can repeat it because it is extremely important. Over repeated use of the substance, the number of dopamine receptors in our brain decreases. However, the strong memory loop that our brain created constantly reminds us of the pleasure and rush that we felt from the very first high, and therefore we continue to abuse the substance. This is why addicts are often left chasing a high that they can no longer biologically achieve. This could lead to more frequent repeated use of the substance or increasing doses of the substance, which could lead to a cocaine overdose. I think it is crucial to know all the facts before deciding whether to participate in a potentially addictive behavior or not. It gives you a chance to weigh out your options and decide whether it's worth it for you. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, cocaine is a Schedule II drug, which means that it has a high potential for abuse. In 2017, cocaine was responsible for about 19% of overdose deaths in the United States alone. And the amount of substance needed for a person to overdose varies greatly between individuals. Cardiac arrests are actually extremely common among these overdoses due to cocaine's ability to severely constrict blood vessels, which produces a spike in blood pressure levels. Therefore, anyone with a pre-existing heart condition is especially at risk of an overdose. Also, mixing cocaine with other drugs such as alcohol can be super detrimental. You might think, oh, I've seen other people do it before, it's not a big deal, or I've mixed coke and alcohol before and nothing happened, but it only takes one. Guys, it only takes one instance for it all to go wrong. And think about what you're risking here. The truth of the matter is, an addict doesn't know that he or she is going to get addicted when they use for the first time. Unfortunately, that is the only time I think we truly have a choice. So make good decisions, guys. Don't fall into peer pressure. Think for yourselves, weigh out the options, and make the right choice before it becomes a disease and you no longer have a choice. So stay safe, and until next time, Rhea the Science Girl, out.